Okay, good morning, everyone. I know um, we're still waiting for a few people to join, and I'm seeing um, a few attendees still popping on, but um, just to keep us on time, we are going to get started. Um, so I just want to thank everybody, obviously, for joining us this morning. We're very excited to have you here and walk you through some updates on the impact that COVID-19 is having on our community um, and how KWCF has been working hard to respond. So I'm going to go over a couple of housekeeping items just before we get started. Um, this webinar will be recorded and we will make it available to all of our attendees. So um, if you want to cycle back or if you feel like you missed something, uh, we will send this out to you next week so you have a chance to come back. If you've used the Zoom before, um, you've used it maybe for regular meetings or connecting with your family uh, to keep in touch during this time. There are a couple of different functions that we'll have today because it is in webinar format. So everybody that's joined us is muted for the conversation except for the panelists that we'll be talking, obviously. So if you have questions, you can use the Q&A section. So if you look down to the bottom, um, you'll see the Q&A section there. You can go in there and type your questions and we'll be compiling questions and the panelists will have a chance to answer uh, towards the end of the session. I'll be monitoring those questions throughout just to make note. There's also a chat function right beside and that's a good spot for you to be able to tell us things uh, like if you're having any tech issues or if you can't hear um, and you want to comment on that or just chat with one another, um, you can do that in the chat function as well. So maybe just to make sure um, that everybody can access, if somebody wants to just hop into the chat function and the Q&A function, and just type us a little message to make sure that everything's working. I think that'll be great. If you have any technical troubles with the video throughout, um, you can just listen as well. So if you want to call in, there's a phone number that was on the invitation um, for this webinar. So if you go back into your email, you can grab a phone number and just call in and listen live. We do have a few people that have joined us on the telephone that aren't on the video. So when we do the Q&A session, for those that are on the phone, we'll give you an opportunity at that session to ask your questions over the phone. Um, but please mute your phone up until we get to that point and we'll make sure that you've got a chance to ask questions over the phone. Um, so I would say thanks again. It seems like the, the chat may be disabled, uh, but we do have the Q&A um, part that seems to be working. So I guess we'll stick with uh, adding some questions into the Q&A part. Um, and then if you have any other things that you want to chat, you can use the Q&A session as well. I think the chat appears to be disabled right now. Um, but if we're good and everybody can hear Elizabeth turn her mic on now, so I'm going to uh, introduce <laughs> Elizabeth Field, President and CEO of the KWCF. I think everybody knows Elizabeth, but she's going to get us um, up and running with our Do More Good dialogue for fund holders this morning. That's great. Thanks a lot, Dan. And as Dan mentioned, thank you so much for joining us today. We'd prefer to be seeing you in person, but since that's not possible, this is the next best thing. Um, and thank you for all that you are doing to assist uh, those that are um, suffering and uh, experiencing, uh, whether it be mental health issues or others during this uh, this situation across Waterloo Region. As we are hearing, every time we turn on the TV or listen to the radio or get news on our devices, COVID-19 is an unprecedented precedented event. We hope you and your loved ones are staying well during this time. This webinar has been scheduled to help you as KWCF fund holders learn about the effects of the pandemic on charities in our community. There are many topics we could have discussed today, but in the interest of time, we've focused our discussion on four areas. First, the area of greatest need, as identified by the charities themselves. Two, emergency funding that is being distributed to charitable organizations through both the partnership of local funders, including KWCF's unrestricted granting dollars, as well as the grants that you have been directing towards COVID-19 needs, and another new development. Third, mental health assistance that's being provided to frontline workers in our community. And finally, we'll share a bit of information about personal protective equipment. 
PPE for short, something I know far more about now than I ever thought I would. Um, we'll hear about some of the supply chain issues and needs that are, exist in Waterloo Region. We have a lot to cover and want to leave time for discussion at the end, so let's get started. When COVID-19 was announced, we knew our charitable partners would be impacted greatly and have many needs. Rather than assume we knew uh, what their challenges were, we quickly conducted a brief five question survey with all of the charities that received grants from our community funds in 2018 and 2019. Our goal was to get a pulse of what was happening in the charitable community as a result of COVID-19. We wanted to ensure the voices of charities were included in any solutions we developed. We've shared some information about the areas of greatest need with some of you that have made granting decisions about your donor advised fund, but we thought it would be useful to give you a greater level of detail during this webinar. So what you'll see on the next slide is a breakdown of the responses. We had a 36% response rate, which was large enough to help us set direction. The majority were in social services at a little over 31%. Next was arts and culture and health at around 17% followed by housing and shelters at 8.6%. And you'll see from the slide, the, the other uh, categories of organizations that, are, that replied. What you also see on your screen is a quote from the CEO of a large charitable organization that has a, been, has a business continuity plan in place. It represents the state of charities a few weeks ago. I'll read it for the benefit of those that are on the phone. We're in an emergency situation, the likes of which we've never seen, all hands on deck. We are all making up the playbook as we go. None of us has any experience at all in this. We make decisions, then throw away the rear view mirror, move on to the next decision. So who did uh, respond? We, we showed you the breakdown of the types of organizations, but we then um, put the respondents into three different charitable profiles. So first, Organizations that were providing essential services to populations that don't suit online or virtual environments, and at least some of their frontline employees must be on site. Second, organizations offering programs or services, but are able to do so remotely for most or all of their employees. And finally, arts organizations, where the majority of programs, services, and events have been canceled due to inability to have audience or social distancing. And some have pivoted, as you've probably seen, and now are able to do things online. All respondent profiles, uh, regardless of the type, were, were all affected by a number of things. The timing. It was during March break, was, which was a high attendance time period for a number of organizations linked to revenue for many of those and that hurt their bottom lines. Event cancellation. So spring is a major event season and the loss of revenue is going to hurt those organizations. Rescheduling might not be an option and if it is possible in the fall, then it will be a very competitive and crowded event season, which will need a lot of collaboration. There was loss of revenue, income, investment returns, and for many this is coupled with new increasing demands at a time that has many unknowns. How and when it ramps up and what that means for changes in current and future operational and strategic plans. Staff concerns, a focus on employees taking care of themselves and their families while servicing their clients, high workloads and burnout potential, the safety of employees, a need for constant communication as situations change, of course, then there's potential layoff implications dependent on the length of the pandemic. Uh, the ability to fundraise is impacted, need for the service, uh, need for government funding, and this varies by organization. There is also an engagement and retention and traction of volunteers that's uh, really important. And so when those volunteers are able to, will they return? Then the need for future business continuity plans, if they don't already have some, some do, and then the need for services to marginalized populations will be amplified, those for new Canadians, indigenous communities, et cetera. I will also give you three specific examples in a few minutes so you can get a clearer picture of these needs on the front lines. As one of the almost 200 community foundations across Canada, KWCF has been fortunate to share what we uh, have been learning and hearing together and develop solutions that can be used in communities where it makes sense. 
Together, we recognized that all charities will be going through three stages as they work through the impact of COVID-19. They will need to respond, like they're doing now, determine how to recover, and in most cases, have to rebuild their operations to move forward. Together with our board, our team developed a plan to help them at every stage. First, the United Way locally launched a COVID-19 Community Response Fund. We are collaborating with them and six other funding organizations to develop and implement a coordinated approach to provide emergency assistance to vulnerable populations across the Waterloo region and to frontline workers assisting them. Those other partners are Social Venture Partners, the Assey Family Foundation, the Lyle S. Hallman Foundation, the Fairmount Foundation, and the Cambridge and North Dumfries Community Foundation. For our first round of funding, we provided charities with one brief application to complete. The maximum funding each charity could apply for was $20,000. We received 55 applications in a very short one week uh, window that we had it open and requesting approximately $950,000. The first round of funding was announced last week, and you, I'm sure, will have seen that, with 43 charities receiving approximately $800,000. Of that total, $100,000 was from KWCF's Community Fund, and an additional $110,000 came from KWCF fund holders like yourselves through either your regular granting or flow-through grants. The next funding will be to deploy the $100,000 in federal funding to assist seniors that the United Way has received and that application will be announced soon. Secondly, there is a huge need for PPE for inner city health alliance, for sanguine health centers, for shelters, for long-term care workers, hospital and other frontline health providers. These include items like cloth gowns, masks, gloves, etc. KDBCF has announced that we will be directing $50,000 to purchase PPE to support community. This is a very complex issue as we have now determined. Uh, you may have seen the article this morning about a uh, quote, Ontario's desperate scramble for N95 masks. They thought they had an order for, I think it was a hundred million masks and uh, they now uh, have been shut down in that, um, that opportunity. So that's a, a huge issue that we'll hear more about later. On April 21st, the Government of Canada announced the creation of the $350 million to support vulnerable Canadians in the fight against COVID-19. Where that was a very welcomed announcement, the ask had been for $7.2 billion. That's what was estimated that the charitable sector across Canada will need in, in a 90-day period to sustain them with revenue sources. These funds will be distributed through a partnership between United Way, Community Foundations, and the Red Cross, and potentially other local partners. We will find out soon what the United Way and Red Cross, um, sorry, we'll, we will find out soon what our community's share of that funding will be. Um, and we will have already started discussions with United Way. Of course, we're already partnering with United Way with the Community Response Fund, and we've reached out and discussed with Red Cross how we can work um, closely together. Uh, so we hope to hear more about that next week, and we'll definitely share those details with you when we find out. Fourthly, charitable organizations are going to need to recover and rebuild. Our charitable partner survey showed us that 50% of the charities were already, and that was early on when we sent that survey out, and they were already thinking about a different method of delivery or support to assist their stakeholders and their clients. Um, that they're doing that now, but that could also benefit from their whole operating model in the long term. Others will need sustainability support as they work together in this new normal. As many are saying, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And once we get through the urgent needs, there will be some heavy lifting required. KWCF has directed $100,000 to start this fund. We've already had fund holders and donors chosen to either grant or donate their money to, donate money to this fund because they are interested in the longer term support. We have not yet determined the parameters for granting or when it will launch. I think that uh, timing question is a question on all of our minds of when we will move out of the respond phase. But uh, again, we will let you know as, as soon as we have those parameters um, determined. And then lastly, impact investments. The due diligence committee has been busy analyzing applications for impact investments, 
some uh, new ones now that are arising due to COVID-19. So it's an exciting time for us as one of the few organizations in Waterloo Region that are doing impact investing to uh, really dig in and see how we can help in ways beyond granting. And as mentioned, I'm now going to share three examples of need in our community. So first is supportive housing of Waterloo. I'm going to just use SHOW as the acronym. SHOW is about more than just housing, as you may know. They provide the program services and supports to help transform the lives of individuals experiencing homelessness, addiction, mental health, and hoarding issues. SHOW supports individuals with whatever they need within their apartments. But the most important role they play is providing emotional support, access to healthcare and staff who are available 24 seven to assist tenants who might be struggling, to help smooth the path to a life that encompasses both stability and dignity. COVID-19 has presented many issues for show because their tenants are those who have been marginalized by poverty, addiction, homelessness, homelessness, ill health, and they are trying to maintain some level of tenant engagement as outside workers are unwilling to visit tenants, leaving high risk individuals without supports. At the same time, the health, mental uh, wellness and safety of their employees is a major issue as they are trying to balance the essential needs while managing a population that is higher risk. The cost associated with additional cleanliness requirements is stretching a budget that was already difficult to manage while meeting the needs of their population. A second example of need is Anishinaabeg outreach. Surprising to many, there are tens of thousands of individuals, uh, it, sorry, there are tens of thousands of Indigenous people living in Waterloo Region. Anishinaabeg outreach provides access to culturally appropriate services and supports and Indigenous, it supports Indigenous individuals and families with direction and assistance to overcome barriers, including areas like employment services, uh, an early on center for childcare and social programming. There were many local Indigenous uh, people uh, in extreme need even before the pandemic struck. Based on healthcare information, for example, Indigenous people make up 50% of the homeless population in the region. Potential challenges and risks for Indigenous people in need include the inability to afford shelter, lack of transportation to access uh, essential services, inability to support home education while schools are closed, access to food, medication, and basic household and supplies for infants and young children. Anishinaabeg Outreach is currently managing a COVID-19 essential items support program delivery service to those who access their center. They are picking up acquired or donated items and delivering them to individuals and families in need. This includes a bicycle program to provide transportation alternatives for individuals who are dependent on public transit and have no other options to get around the community. This program is being designed to help mitigate the financial, emotional, and social impacts on Indigenous community members affected by COVID-19. Additional funding is being provided for PPE for the staff and volunteers managing this program through the community um, fund that we, uh, I talked about earlier. And lastly, Independent Living Centre of Waterloo Region. You may know that this organization is as people with disabilities live independent lives. The program they came to us to support was their attendance services program, a program that provides daily support to more than 230 people in Waterloo Region. They do this by individually providing personal care to individuals with physical disabilities for tasks they can't afford, perform because of limitations or impairments resulting from permanent physical disability. The personal support workers assist with things like getting out of bed, bathing, helping prepare food, eating and other personal services. These individuals work tirelessly to assist these people in their care and PPE supplies are in huge demand and they need more to keep both their PSWs and their clients safe. I'm now pleased to introduce Alison Demieu. Alison is Director of Strategy and Community Engagement at the Canadian Mental Health Association of Waterloo Wellington. In her role, Allison works to improve the quality and experience of care, 
raises awareness and reduces the stigma of mental health and works to create meaningful partnerships in the goal of building mentally healthy communities. Previous to her role at CMHA, Allison was senior manager of health system transformation at the Waterloo Wellington Local Health Integration Network. Before entering the world of local health care, Allison was a founding partner at Overlap Associates, a design thinking firm in the Waterloo region. There, Allison worked with clients in technology, municipalities, healthcare, and other industries who have challenges with creativity and innovation. With a background in public policy, public affairs, marketing and communication, Allison works with teams to overcome obstacles and realize a shared vision. Allison honed her negotiation and partnership skills in the public sector working on Parliament Hill in Washington, DC, and as a member of the senior leadership team at the Center for International Governance in Innovation and International Affairs Think Tank, as I'm sure you know, in Waterloo. Allison has a BA honors and a Bachelor of Education from the University of Ottawa and an MA in, MA in History from Western University. Allison, thank you for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I'm not sure if this is working and if everybody can see me or not. Great. Um, so I just want to start by saying thank you. Uh, these are absolutely extraordinary times. And uh, I really want to commend all the funders for coming together uh, and doing an extraordinary thing by creating an immediate emergency fund for uh, the charitable sector to access. Uh, there are great innovations happening all across this community, and there's no way that these could have been realized uh, without this funding. So uh, really a big thank you to, to everybody there who has been a contributor to this. Um, let me just start by giving you a quick background on, on the Canadian Mental Health Association, CMHA locally. Um, we happen to be the largest CMHA in the country. Uh, we serve Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Guelph, and Wellington. Uh, we have about 450 staff uh, on, uh, in, our, in, the, in those geographies that work at about uh, seven different locations. Um, when COVID hit, uh, we quickly moved to trying to be a virtual uh, online healthcare agency. And you can imagine the trials and tribulations that, that, uh, that took place. Uh, we were successful in moving about 400 out of our 450 staff into an online virtual environment, um, providing uh, uh, online psychiatry, group therapy, uh, children's counseling, uh, seniors outreach. Uh, now, we still have a, a percentage of our, our staff that are still seeing clients face-to-face. -face. Most of those are crisis, emergency psychiatry, injections. Uh, there was a huge emphasis on making sure that our programs and services were still running and still open for business uh, to make sure that folks didn't need to go to hospital. So a lot of that was about hospital care avoidance and still is to this day. I do want to tell you a lot about today about our uh, Here for Healthcare initiative though. This started, we, we uh, are lucky enough to be on conversations daily with our hospital and primary care partners in the Ontario health teams around this region. And uh, very early on, uh, the question came to us to say, we know that the, the personal protective equipment, the, the, the uh, risk and assessment of our healthcare workers uh, from a physical health perspective was priority number one, but they already were identifying the need to keep our uh, frontline workers, and that includes hospitals, primary care, and long-term care, uh, protected from a mental health perspective as well. Uh, we knew going into this that the trauma that was going to be uh, uh, undertaken by our frontline workers was going to be severe, that this was, in a lot of cases, going to be some of the most challenging times that they would experience, and they would need to be set up with, essentially, uh, protective equipment from a mental health perspective. So we very quickly, and with your support, were able to create uh, an online space uh, that is uh, accessible through the CMHA website as well as going to here for number four healthcare.ca. Uh, when you go there, it's very simple and easy to use process. There is an online referral form. People fill out a few questions and then somebody's in contact with them within 24 hours. They can also call. Uh, we happen to be the provider of the 
HERE247 line, which is always open, and that is the region's uh, crisis uh, mental health line. Uh, it is the intake uh, line as well for 12 different mental health and addictions agencies locally. Uh, so that's always uh, open for business. Uh, but then also what we did was we did, we, we curated uh, online resources really specifically for those who are in the healthcare sector that's meaningful to them. And those are self-care options for them to access as well as information for their families, for their friends, um, and, and that's that they could just access at any time. Uh, no matter what it is that they felt that they were dealing with, they can get online and find information right there. And it was the curation of that really from our experts online um, that was really quite powerful. The services that we're delivering, again, are curated specifically for those in the healthcare sector. Uh, we have online psychiatry, group therapy, uh, psychologists, uh, and anybody who just needs a question answered about how they're doing and giving some tools and techniques to get through the day. The goal of these is to, to feel that people are feeling mentally strong enough to get back to work. Uh, and mentally strong enough uh, to manage the, the, again, the challenging work environment that they're facing today. Um, so that is, that is what we've created. Uh, it was launched about two weeks ago. It took us about seven days to get this up and running. An amazing team effort by, by the team at CMHA to do this. Uh, very soon after that, I will let you know, uh, we realized that, that we needed to do this for the general public as well. So about a week after we launched Here for Healthcare, we launched here for the number for help.ca. And that is a, a, a similar process for the general public. You'll find information there for kids, youth, parents, for adults, for seniors and their caregivers, as well as for employees and employers who are also feeling the challenges of, of what is a very stressful environment right now. Um, many of you might have seen that there was a CBC poll that came out last weekend that talked that over half of Canadians now believe that their mental health is worse. Uh, and we're seeing that, I mean, I don't know of anybody who's not feeling some sort of traumatic effect uh, from this, no matter where you are. Uh, we're also going to see the effects of that for a very long time. Some people are referring to this as essentially the echo pandemic, that the real traumatic effects, the psychological effects, uh, won't be felt right now while our adrenaline is high and while we're moving through this as a physical health crisis, but that in fact, we will see the effects um, on our mental health from the traumatic, from both economically, uh, physically, uh, just all the sort of social isolation needs for quite some time to come. I don't know if there's a possibility that you can go to the next slide. Um, I found this slide quite useful. Um, and this is where we're looking at those four waves of the pandemic. The first is really what we've been experiencing the last few weeks, which is the immediate needs and the mortality in, uh, of, of COVID-19. Um, the second wave there is really the effects that you're seeing on non-urgent with the elective procedures in hospitals and our inability to walk right into our doctor's offices to have things dealt with. The third wave is really what we're seeing is the impact on chronic conditions, those long-term effects of uh, shortages of drugs, of, of the conditions that people are dealing with on an everyday basis, and not having access to those ongoing preventative care uh, needs. But the fourth wave, as you'll note there, is going to be the largest in terms of impact. And that is the psychiatric trauma that we're all facing, um, the burnout that everybody's facing, and really the effects of what we're going to see uh, from the economic impacts of this. So I, it's not to say that we're not all, the whole healthcare system isn't a, a facing the effects of this, but the footprint, uh, we do have to be cognizant of the, the mental health impacts of this. Uh, I would encourage you all to go to Here for Help uh, and Here for Healthcare and, and take a look around. Uh, if you are in fact uh, feeling the effects of mental health and, and some of those signs and symptoms may be changes to how you're uh, undergoing your everyday activities. If you're finding that you're sleeping more, sleeping less, uh, that you're finding the inability to, to go through daily activities. If you're finding difficulty finding joy right now in your everyday activities. Uh, if the willingness to sort of get out of bed and, and start the day is difficult. If you're having difficulty uh, feeling the need to go out for a walk. 
uh, all of those are in fact signs and symptoms uh, that uh, you or your family members might be experiencing with mental health. I would encourage you for the most part, we can do um, self-care activities to manage that on an everyday basis. But if you're do, you do find that you or, or loved ones, friends, families, colleagues are having difficulty uh, and those are, are the duration of those signs and symptoms uh, is, is, is long, uh, please call one 844 here 247 even if you just have a question that is the the crisis line that is always um, uh, staffed by people 24 7 uh, so it's always there available for you um, with that I, I'll take any questions uh, when we have question time but I really again want to thank you for the generosity to make this program take place Great. Thank you so much, Allison. And uh, we definitely are so uh, thankful that you are here for us and, and here for the healthcare workers. So thank you to you and the team at CMHA for really being able to pivot so quickly to get this, uh, to get this launched. I'd now like to introduce our next guest. Amber French is the managing partner at Catalyst Capital, a firm focused on technology and interesting real estate investments in Waterloo Region. She is a passionate advocate for Canada's angel investing ecosystem as co-founder and principal at Archangel Network of Funds. Amber holds a BSc from the University of Waterloo and is owner operator of Catalyst Commons at Catalyst 137 and previously Verity Financial. As a big believer in supporting and propelling Canadian startups, Amber serves as a mentor and coach to programs such as the Founders Institute and Fierce Founders, and is also a proud Rotary. I've got to know Amber through our quest to purchase PPE, and I'm delighted she could join us this morning. Hi, Amber. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Oh, thank you so much for having me here today and thanks so much for everything that KWCF is doing uh, advocating on behalf of our community. So I, like you, months ago never thought I would know as much about PPE as I do today. Uh, it's been a steep learning curve but this all started about two months ago um, before we even had our first case of COVID in the region. I ended up getting looped into a private group of just private individuals who were looking to support our hospitals in any way that they were able to. So at that time, one of the main concerns that our hospitals had was the sustainability of their traditional supply chain, especially when it was concerning PPE. So when I say PPE, it's been in the news, you guys all know it's personal protective equipment. So it's anything uh, from surgical masks and 95 masks, gowns, gloves, face shields, uh, and even hand sanitizer and surface uh, sterilizer or surface sanitizer. Uh, these are all things that we're experiencing a, a global shortage for. Um, so hospitals and our local health integration network, the LIN, is having a really hard time procuring some of these items uh, in a reliable way. So I didn't have any experience in PPE before this, um, but through my work uh, with Catalyst Capital and investing in investors, I have a really large network of people who um, do have access to alternative supply chains. So um, a lot of manufacturers and distributors in different countries. So to help the hospitals, I initially uh, started placing some feeler phone calls out to um, these various manufacturers and distributors. And what started out um, as just a couple of phone calls has turned into a 60 plus hour week job for the last couple of months. Um, and it's, it's resulted in a lot of great procurement opportunities that the hospital um, didn't have access to before. So there has been, have been some successes. So Unfortunately, uh, Canada, the way that we've organized our PPE procurement system, we've commoditized it to a point where we're very reliant on uh, importing from other countries. So we're really at the mercy of other countries' productions and their export policies. And so that's uh, obviously causing a lot of issues right now, uh, just as the global shortage increases. So as the shortage intensifies, countries are placing export restrictions um, and reserving the product uh, to, for use within their own countries. So it's really tightening up, getting difficult to get product out of uh, China and some in the US especially. So this is acting to drive up the price of PPE. So for things like surgical masks, for example, what used to cost 10 cents for a mask is now cost anywhere from $1 to $1.50 US. And these 3M and 95 masks that our hospitals uh, have fit tested their employees for are in such hot demand that they're going for now between five and 10 US dollars per mask. So the price gouging uh, and the increases that have gone on are pretty incredible uh, to see. And it's just getting worse as time goes on. So there's a few other issues and challenges when it comes to accessing alternative supply chains. 
So you can imagine um, in this, this current climate, there are a lot of opportunists, opportunists who are taking advantage of the situation. So there's a lot of fraud that's happening. Uh, there's been a lot of news stories about just PPE that's come into the country that's just not been um, reliable to use. It's not, it's not FDA approved like it said it was. Uh, there's counterfeit certifications, counterfeit products. It's also becoming increasingly difficult to navigate the shipping as well. So air freight has increased in price and it's just becoming really hard to reliably get planes uh, to come in. So especially as it, they come through the US. So there's been stories of um, some kind of shady dealings going on where we've lost PPE um, through channels in the US, uh, which is a bit surprising in this day and age. So the other issue is that there's also large minimum orders now. So as these distributors and manufacturers consolidate, you're having to place million dollar plus PO uh, to be competitive enough to to um, get the product. So I've mainly been working, initially started working with the hospitals and the Lynn groups, uh, vetting and forwarding some of these newer deals. As time goes out, has gone on, uh, I've started to work more and more with community groups. So the frontline workers who are most drastically affected by these PPU shortages are the community providers, um, the ones that are not, um, that don't have access to the provincial stores as mandated by the Lynn. So these are anyone from hospice, uh, physicians, specialists, shelters, uh, group homes, charitable organizations, public health groups, fire police, midwives, indigenous outreach groups. So there's literally hundreds of providers um, that don't have necessarily access to these provincial stores. And traditionally these groups have placed PPE purchase orders by themselves as their own individual organization at their own individual organiza organizational level. And so supply chain was never a problem. Uh, it's never been stressed to the point that it is at right now. So they never had an issue ordering before. But now in today's climate where you're having to pace, place these multi-million dollar POs, um, you can imagine an individual organization just they, they can't compete in this climate. So one of the first things that we ended up doing uh, about a month ago, we hosted a community PPE drive, and that was really to leverage existing PPE stores from businesses um, that have either slowed or closed down in our community. And that was a great success. So we ended up uh, having donated thousands of boxes of gloves, um, thousands of boxes of masks, hundreds of hand-sewn gowns. And so that's actually been operated out of the Westmount Golf Course. Uh, that's kind of become an unofficial distribution hub, the curling lounge there, um, where we have a local doctor who's been organizing the allocation of those and I know a lot of you would be familiar with Toby Day Hamilton. She has been volunteering a ton of her time uh, and help in helping, um, helping these community groups get these pieces allocated out. You can imagine now uh, it's been a month so those stores are being exhausted. So for the last couple of weeks I've really turned uh, to working with Belin to come up with an alternative solution to organize these groups uh, into an almost a modern day medical cooperative buying group. So we're trying to find a way where we can turn all of these individual fragmented groups into one big buying group that can be competitive when placing POs like a hospital or whatnot. And so we've been working uh, quite hard being backed by the Lynn to come up with a solution for our community and it's, it's still in the works, but it's, we're going to be using um, private funds to basically to place these POs and we're going to have a mechanism to um, place these orders and distribute them to all of the various community groups that don't have access to the provincial stores. So the pandemic has certainly shone a light on the shortcomings in our system. Uh, it's definitely shown we need more visibility and accountability for our community providers and we need a more sustainable Canadian supply chain. So I'll just end on a couple of good news stories. So our region's really stepped up um, as far as manufacturing our own PPE goes. So we have companies that have been in the media lately, uh, like Inksmith, we worked with them to get uh, their Health Canada license expedited. And so they're 3D printing reusable face shields to such great success that the federal government just placed an OAP PO for 10 million of these um, masks, which is fantastic. It's a great story for our region. We also have a, a host of other companies like O2. They're working uh, to create a reusable N95 mask with just little replacement cartridge filters instead of having to replace the entire mask. So that can really um, solve a massive issue when it comes to these N95 masks to make it a lot more sustainable. We have companies like Eclipse and ATS who are in the process of retooling to create the more traditional N95 masks. We have a company called Barbarian Sportswear who's retooled to create fluid resistant hospital grade gowns and they're actually gonna be starting ramping up production uh, any day now, which is really exciting because gowns are a very hot ticket item that nobody can find at this point. And then lastly, we have companies like uh, Structure3D 
or even uh, 3D printing face swabs or um, testing swabs, uh, which is really interesting. Um, so the 3D printing has, has been um, quite a savior lately. And I think our, our community, because we're so tech focused, we're um, uniquely positioned to really help ramp this up and create a, a more, supply, more sustainable supply chain. Another thing that we've been looking at uh, very closely is uh, sterilization methods. So ways where we can reuse, uh, sterilize and reuse certain PPE items like N95 masks. So the government has been mandated to across Ontario um, roll out 25 different sterilization for reuse hubs. And I believe we are going to be getting one in KW. So that's something that's hopefully going to be integrated into this community. Um, initiative that we're working on right now. And so the, they're doing testing right now on which units make the most sense. So I think the front runner is going to be a machine that uses a combination of hydrogen peroxide mist, mist and UVC light. And they're gonna be able to um, sterilize thousands and thousands of masks every day. And so the community groups, uh, it'll help them to really extend uh, their, their PPE usage. So just, I guess in conclusion, PPE, it's uh, certainly a complex issue. Uh, there's a lot of moving components that are happening right now. We're really working hard to help these community groups because they are truly the ones that are needing the most help. So again, it's great to have um, organizations like KWCF who are advocating on behalf of these groups so they're not getting missed. So thank you very much for having me today. Great. Thanks so much, Amber. And uh, what I didn't mention in Amber's bio is that she uh, used to be with Johnson & Johnson in medical mm. procurement. And so that coupled with your Bachelor of Science from the University of Waterloo, I think yeah. is coming in handy. So never underestimate what some of your past experiences and how they make them to true. focus against. So thank you thank for you. all you're doing on this topic. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So I think at this point, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Uh, he's been uh, getting some questions in through the uh, Q&A function, uh, some privately and some, some through the, uh, the mainstream. So please don't hesitate to, uh, to put your questions in there. We have, we're actually right on time. We have 15 minutes left to do, those, uh, to, to do the Q&A. So uh, Dan, over to you. Yeah, and I just want to remind our friends on the phone too, um, if you want to unmute and ask a question, um, please feel free to do so. I'll, I'll hold for a couple seconds now if you want to jump in with a question, and if not, I'll start with a few that we received. Okay, so why don't we jump in, and if I can get um, Amber, maybe if you want to hop back on with your video, just to... Uh, follow up to what you had mentioned, you, you talked about some of the local companies and of course, with all the great tech happening in our community, there's been some great organizations helping. Do you know, is any of the PPE that they are producing staying in our community or is it, do you know much about sort of how? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, so through this private initiative, um, Communitech has really um, stepped in and taken an active role in helping to um, manage on behalf of these companies and advocate for, for them. So for Inksmith, for example, the first 25,000 units that they produced went to the hospitals in our region here. They've also, I ended up um, getting a call from Innisfree Hospice that they were really short on certain supplies. So re I reached out to Inksmith um, and they donated uh, 30 face shields that I just hand delivered there. So they're really working uh, actively to procure for our community first. Barbarian Sports, where the company who's going to be producing the gowns, all of those gowns, they're going to be able to produce 20,000 right off the hop. Those are all likely going to stay at hospitals in our region. And I'm going to be trying to get uh, some on behalf of our community as well, because I know mass gowns are um, a really challenging item to get. But the, the, the um, companies are all wanting to provide for our region first, which is fantastic. And then we'll hopefully supply to, um, to regions outside. That's great. Thank you. Um, we got a, another question today that I've actually had a few conversations about um, over the past few weeks as well. So this is for Elizabeth. So, so there was a lot of talk, of course, about how the charities uh, in our community and of course across the country are being impacted. So the question was, how is KWCF being impacted in terms of our investment portfolio? Um, are, are our funds going to be in a position to continue granting if the markets sort of stay as they are right now, which is you know a little volatile and, and seeing some low returns? Great. Thanks, Dan. So uh, at the end of quarter one, our uh, results were down a little over 10%. So 10.5% was the market return. As you may know, though, we do have, uh, we, we do have a plan in place to uh, 
to mitigate that risk, and that is with our stabilization of our reserves. And so for our, fortunately, at the end of last year, the market uh, was very favorable and came in at 16.5%. So that's allowed us to top up our granting stabilization reserves back up to almost to the two-year um, limit, which is what we, we do. So it's done at each individual fund level. So, uh, but overall, for all funds, we're back up to that two years of stabilization. So that means that we can weather the storm this year and for another year uh, with regards to a downturn in a market, in the market. You know, it's anybody's guess what the market is going to return um, by the end of the year. But, um, you know, there are some optimistic uh, projections that we will see uh, at least some of that loss rebound um, towards the end of the year. So, um, but we are, Dan, in, in good shape to be able to sustain uh, granting through uh, multiple years after this. And as far as our own operations, we have, uh, obviously, everyone's working from home, as you can, as you can tell. Um, and uh, we've been really lucky that we have been able to, uh, the team is actually busier than ever. So there's been no shortage of work for us. And um, we've been very fortunate to be able to keep everyone working, uh, supporting this, uh, both COVID and some of the other work that we already had on the go. That's great. Thank you. Um, Allison, we got a question that came in from you with regards to the Here for Healthcare. Um, do we know, do we have a sense yet of how it's being used um, or if we can track the, the impact that it's having? I can imagine, of course, it's such a, a high stress situation for those working in healthcare. So just curious if, if you're tracking usage yet. Yeah, we've been keeping a track, obviously, of the number of people that are calling, uh, the reasons why they're calling. That's important for us to understand how to pivot and change services to be able to meet those needs. Um, I can tell you that it's a very steady use. So uh, we were, we, which is good. We were a bit worried that maybe we would be overwhelmed with that. And when I showed that uh, projection of the waves, though, we are expecting that uh, we'll see an increase in the level of need for mental health services, perhaps over the next few months and into the next year, that that's where we're going to actually see that peak from our perspective. Um, so we are watching that steady increase come in. I think it's far more, uh, people are far more aware of the service, which is good, and, and we want that to be the case. Uh, so please share and let people know that this exists. Um, we interestingly are seeing right now, um, a lot of the calls that we're getting are for their own personal mental health, but a lot of it is for their, the mental health of their families. Uh, when we're watching folks, especially those frontline workers, uh, deal with this. We're watching really the family deal with this. A lot of them are staying isolated from uh, their, their immediate family, uh, either living in a separate part of the house or even outside of the house completely, and they're experiencing that real sense of isolation because of that. They're also nervous about coming home um, with COVID-19 and spreading that to their, their family, and so that, that level of anxiety is very, very high. Uh, so we're actually working with a lot of uh, people as a family. So we're providing care not only to the frontline uh, worker in this case, but also to the kids and spouses that might be involved with this. Um, and as I said, uh, we, uh, you know, we're seeing a spike in our online traffic. So I'm hopeful that a lot of people are just accessing the online resources that are there. Our first psychiatry group, which launches on Friday, is full. So uh, we're hoping again that uh, people are getting the care that they need, but we're watching that really intently to see how do we add services into that as needed. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, question for Elizabeth and I both, I guess. So we've, we've been made aware um, of a manulife match um, with, with donations made to St. Mary's. And the question is, um, will grants made from our donor directed donor by funds be eligible for that match. Um, so I think that's something that Elizabeth and I can take away and we can chat with our counterparts at St. Mary's. Um, we, we have done some granting to St. Mary's as, as part of the past month's grants. Um, so we can reach out to them and, and ensure that they would qualify in the same way that other donations do. So we'll circle back on that. There's been a few people actually that have asked about that. Um, and so a question for Amber, um, there's there's chat about the, about PPE um, shortages, of course. But how do we, just as everyday citizens, 
um, access PPE or is there sort of a way that we can get it other than just sort of hope that it's at the stores when we get to the stores? Yeah, it's it's a it's a big problem, uh, and even just as we we start to talk about returning to life as normal, uh, there's there's likely going to be um, pro policies and processes in place where we're going to need to be using masks at on an in, on an individual level, and we don't have access to them yet. So it's something that we're working uh, really hard. Uh, I'm right now trying to procure, procure uh, a massive amounts of level one masks. So these are masks that not necessarily um, family physicians and things like that, frontline providers would wear, but it's something that the general public can wear. And that's something that we're really going to try to find channels to find to distribute uh, into our communities. So right now it's there's not a an efficient way for community at large to get these these kind of PPE products apart from just lucking out when you go to a store. So again, it's something that uh, that we're working to try to solve right now too. Great, and if I can just keep you on there, Amber, there's a, a question here that came through too. If you can just provide any comment on the need for testing devices or techniques or sort of any knowledge in that space. Yeah, so this is actually something that uh, Communitech is working uh, very deeply involved in. There's a few local companies who they're working with University of Waterloo in addition to a few private companies who have developed home test testing kits, uh, as well as some uh, blood based testing kits that we're going to be working with hospitals uh, to to test out um, the theory on as well antibody testing. Um, they're not available yet, um, but it's something that yeah that that's actively being looked into on a, a, by a few different um, organizations. Great, thank you. Uh, another question for Elizabeth. Um, so there is a lot of, of course, information that was gained by KWCF during surveys and chatting with charitable partners, but do we know much about what's happening with arts organizations right now and what their needs are? We keep seeing about tickets, of course, tickets having to be refunded because shows and performances can't happen. So um, anything that KWCF has sort of learned about what's happening in the arts? Mm -hmm. It's certainly a topic of conversation during our weekly calls that I have with uh, our peers across the country and other large community foundations. Uh, I, I will likely get this number wrong, so I may have to come back with a, but I believe it's something like a million dollars a week that's being lost in ticket sale revenue from the largest arts organizations across the country. And so, um, you know, definitely we heard through the initial survey that we did um, of, of the situation with having to cancel performances. We're also, as I mentioned earlier, seeing some innovation in finding ways like the symphony every Friday night is, has a performance. Um, and so there are, um, there's what I think we need to do, Dan, to is uh, resurvey those organizations now or in another few weeks to say, you know, what what are you hearing now? Because we did do that survey very early on, and so we really need to take another temperature check to see uh, how locally they're doing. But uh, nationally, we know there are some some very large concerns. Okay, we just saw another question come through, and I'm wondering maybe for Elizabeth. Uh, and Allison, if they can comment um, just around the homeless population in the community um, and the integration of the Indigenous um, people in the community as well, and sort of how, how are the supports working um, for Indigenous people separately or as part of the entire community, and if we, if we can sort of speak to the needs of, of that group, or if they're any different than what we're seeing with the rest of the community. Allison, do you want to jump in first? Well, I, I think I, the only thing I would say is, um, you know, the Indigenous population, um, urban, we're interestingly, our geography from a health service provider, so our LIN geography, uh, is one of the only ones in Ontario that doesn't formally have a, 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 an Indigenous community formally known as a reservation. Um, so most of the Indigenous population in our community is urban in that sense. Um, so as a result, uh, it's, it, it tends to be a, a disparate group that is not organized from both a health services perspective, but then also from an advocacy perspective. Um, what we also know is that from a health equity perspective, the Indigenous population uh, has far more likely to have social economic issues, especially as it relates to health issues, mental health and addictions and homelessness. So a disproportionate amount of that population. 
Uh, and with an urban setting, really what you're talking about there is accessing care within the existing structures that we have, uh, and hopefully doing so with a culturally appropriate way, uh, which is a deficit in our community for sure. Uh, CMHA with other organizations, House of Friendship, um, the shelter system, uh, the Working Center, for example, have had uh, a pretty extensive amount of outreach, especially during COVID-19. Uh, we've been working with the shelter system to provide uh, uh, funding for um, motels and hotels, which right now is the solution for a lot of the homeless population, as we try and create a situation where you can have social isolation, uh, but having access to safe housing. Um, but it is absolutely a concern and, and organizations like Elizabeth spoke about earlier, the uh, uh is, is vital to be able to provide really what is our true health equity with a culturally appropriate care. Great, and I just, I wanna be mindful of time. Um, so we do have one more question that's come through the chat. Last opportunity for anyone on the phone if you wanna jump in with a question. Um, and if not, we'll move to the last one on the chat, and this will be for Amber. Do you provide any comment on the masks that are coming from the home sewing community? We're seeing, of course, a lot of people that are looking to find ways at home to help out. And, and I actually, I just read something that starting next week, Costco is going to make masks mandatory for shoppers. And we may see that as we start to unroll the reopening of organizations. So any comment on the ability yes. to produce those from home? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, any protection is better than no protection at all. So there, there is some level of protection that you can have by the homemade masks. They're not appropriate. We've had a lot of um, sewing guilds reach out trying to create masks on behalf of our frontline workers. And it's unfortunately not something that's appropriate, the level of protection for them to wear. But for the general public, it's, it's a fantastic way to, um, to protect yourselves a little bit more than um, if you can't access traditional masks. Thank you. So I think what we'll do, um, there's one more question here about a master list on priorities um, in terms of giving from the individual fund. So let Elizabeth and I will take that back um, and consider ways to get some of that information in front of our fund holders, especially those that haven't granted yet. Right. Um, we are going to be entering into another round of, of granting for community response. Um, with the partnership that we've got with the other organizations. So we'll find a way to get some priorities in front of fund holders. Uh, but before we go, we just want to throw a couple poll questions up um, if people can answer those for us. And this will just give us a little bit of a sense of what kind of information that you're interested in hearing to stay engaged. Um, and if we were going to host another webinar, um, what sort of topics would be of interest. So hopefully you've had a poll just come up on your screen right now. There's two questions. Um, and if you can answer those for us, then we'll be able to just tally those responses. And, and while just, need to... that, just a reminder, we did record the webinar today, so we'll have an opportunity to send that out um, if you want to watch it again to sort of take some notes on any of the information that any of our speakers shared today. I know there's a lot of content there. Uh, very important for us to know as fund holders and just as individual people, uh, there's a lot going on in the community that's hard to wrap our head around. So. If there's any other questions, feel free to reach out to Elizabeth directly, myself directly, anyone from the team. Um, of course, we're always happy to help answer. And a big thank you um, to Amber and Allison for joining us today and taking time to share your expertise in two um, really interesting areas that I think a lot of people are either experiencing on their own or are in part, part of conversations with others. So hopefully everyone took a few nuggets today that, that they can share um, amongst your family and your network as you're having conversations. That's great, Dan. And I'd just like to add my thanks uh, to the team as well for pulling this together, a different experience for us, uh, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. And thank you to everyone uh, who was able to join. We do plan to do uh, another one of these uh, based on your uh, feedback. Um, and so uh, as Dan mentioned, if you have a chance to do that poll just before you leave, that would be great. So. I think that's it, right, Dan? This is a wrap. That's it. Okay. We wore our KWCF shirts, but us, no one yeah. can see. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Um, we appreciate you joining us today, and we'll be in touch soon.